Well, good to be back in Brizzy. How's everybody? Thank you. The rest of you, I presume, are not from Brizzy. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, always good to be back home. Uh, I run a think tank now in the United States called the Asia Policy Institute. Therese and I are in New York most of the time. Um, but it's always good to be back here, and particularly during an Ashes series. <laughs> and for those who have come here and pretend to be Australians when we know that they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and as we say, whenever we lose a game of cricket in a series like that, it's great for the game, um, which is really our way of saying, what a bugger that the Poms won. <laughs> the, um, I have a prepared text for you this evening. And you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but for those of you who are by instinct swats uh, and uh, like to peruse the document as opposed to someone's extempore, it can be found on our website, uh, which is just kevinrudd.com. So go and have a look and see what you think. And it may bear occasional relationship with what I'm about to say. Um, Tonight, what I wanted to do uh, was talk to you about what I believe to be the complacent country. That's Australia. Complacent about its future. And therefore, to challenge you and to challenge the country on what we do to seize the future. Hence the topic before you, which is alternative visions for Australia's future. Some would question why it is valid in 2019 to talk about the utility of a national vision for the country. Is this the stuff of dreamy-eyed leftist utopians? Or is it something which is of substance which can actually direct the work of public policy to produce real outcomes for the country and what we seek to do through the country and the world? I'm very much of the latter school. And I have that view because, having been in the business of government, I'm acutely conscious of how much our work in government is overwhelmed by the events of the day. I'm acutely conscious of the extent to which the day's media grind actually drives so much of the national political process as politicians of the left and the right, of Labor and the Liberals, uh, race after the journalists of the day in order to apply the fire hose of the moment to extinguish the issue which will burn their political careers tomorrow. And as a consequence, we are not just dealing with the tactical versus the strategic. So much of our national political energies are, spoke, are spent on dealing with the trivial rather than the substantial. And what drives me most to this topic, and the themes I'll address this week at universities across the country, uh, is that we now find ourselves at a national crossroads where there are a series of fundamental challenges, structural challenges, bearing down on our country, some from at home, but frankly, most from abroad, which if we do not address and take seriously, will overwhelm us in time. And therefore, on the question of the practical utility of a national vision for our country's future, it is not simply, therefore, something to make you feel warm and cuddly on the inside, but is in the business of shaping and crafting core concrete policy responses which are sustainable over time in dealing with the long-term structural challenges to which I've just referred. And so tonight I intend to do two things. One is spend some time elaborating on what I identify to be seven core structural challenges confronting the country. And second, to begin to elaborate what might be described as the foundation stones of a national vision for our country's future. Foundation stones to do with our concept of who we are as a people, our concept of what values we stand for, and our concept of what are our abiding national interests. Because these three sets of foundation stones shape, in fact, the nature of the policy course of action and therefore the political course of action we need to embrace as a nation. 
And during the course of the week, I intend uh, to then, departing from those general themes, speak specifically on alternative visions for the economy's future, to speak on alternative visions for our country's approach to the existential challenge of our climate and climate change, as well as the questions of our future and alternative futures in the region and in the world, given the rise of China. And finally, to deal with the question of the future of our democracy itself, the institutions of our democracy, including the critical role of the media within it, including the Murdoch media and other subhuman species. <laughs> That'll get me a good rap in the Courier Mail tomorrow, <laughs> for sure. But I find myself puzzlingly on that latter question to be one of the few systematically and uh, continually across the nation drawing attention to this, this central fact that our ability as a nation to have a substantive conversation and resolution about the policy direction in which our country needs to go is shaped and in my view, excessively so, by the political ideology of those who own and direct the bulk of our print media in this country. It holds our country back from a substantive conversation about the way we need to go forward. And that is why I've chosen systemically uh, to address that as part of this series as well. So, my friends, if you're interested in any of those other substantive themes on the economy and on climate, on the regional and global order given China's rise, or on the institutions of our democracy, you can also uh, race to the website and find what other texts, other texts I may circulate there as the week progresses. Alternatively, you can simply go to sleep, uh, whichever you'd prefer. <laughs> It's a democracy. We are free to snooze. <laughs> but not you. You look too intelligent. <laughs> Let me turn first to the question of the challenges we face for the future. I said before I intend to identify seven, and these may be familiar to some and less familiar to others, but they are based on my own experiences leading an American think tank now for the last four years, having spent a year or so prior to that at the Kennedy School at Harvard, um, but also spending a lot of my time addressing university audiences and public policy institutions across Asia, particularly in China, across the United States and in Europe. This is my attempt to distill what I see to be generic challenges facing our respective democracies, <clears throat> but with particular reference to this Australian democracy. Number one, the fundamental destabilising nature uh, of the quantum technology challenge, the great technological disruption that is unfolding at a pace and with an intensity across all that we seek to do in public policy and in our lives that no previous generation has had to contend with. And this is collectively causing a deep disruption to our politics, our media, our economy, our society, our happiness, and in fact, the way in which we seek to do business in the world at large. There are enormous upsides to this great revolution in technology, and you're familiar at this great institution with many of them, just as they are, at the same time, enormously disruptive. And there are, if we are to have an open and clear mind about it, deeply disruptive and deeply damaging to some as we look at the large displacement of people from the traditional workforce into work which may not exist at all for them in the future. This deep challenge of technology, therefore, and the pace and intensity of the ICT revolution and what flows from it in its various subcategories, most spectacularly artificial intelligence, is something which your generation will need to contend with. It is the fundamental great disruptor of our age. And for this country, Australia, to argue just one proposition as a subset of it, unless we become uh, the innovators ourselves of the new great technologies of the future, 
we will simply be left in the dust. There is an extent to which we have prided ourselves in being the great adapters in the past of new technologies. We have also been, as you know from the record, great inventors of new technologies. But we have not been enormous national entrepreneurs in taking those inventions and innovations to global market. Name me one single Australian global technology brand. They are not easy to roll off the lips. And that is not a reflection of the deficit of our national intelligence. They do not reflect the paucity of our national academic institutions. And the fact that we have five of the world's top 100 research universities in this country. But there is something missing. Unless we deal with that of itself in this rewriting of the drivers of global economic growth for the future, there is a great danger this country will be left behind. Challenge number two, existential, climate. You are familiar with it. I will not rehearse here the scientific literature. For those who continue to deny the reality of climate change based on the science, I suggest you consult at the, this university a consulting psychologist or even psychiatrist. <laughs> My view as a graduate in tongue poetry, uh, and therefore with not a single science bone in my body, not one, is that you simply need to read the definitive reports from institutions such as the CSIRO uh, or from Australia's chief scientists to reach a conclusion that the science is in, that climate change is happening, and that absent remedial action by governments around the world to bring greenhouse gas uh, emissions down, that we are on track to see global temperature increases of between two and four degrees centigrade by century's end, of fundamental disruptive capacity across all countries in the world, whether it is southeastern and southwestern Australia, uh, where drought will become more intense, whether it is floods in the northern part of our country, whether it is the incremental desertification of North China, north of the Yangtze, uh, or whether it is a further extension of the desert areas of Africa, the implications for the above in terms of normal ways in which we prosecute business as a nation and as a community uh, will be deeply disturbed. Challenge number two. Challenge number three is the fracturing of the global order. And many of you here are students of politics, international relations. I commend you for doing so. Those of you who are not, I commend you for having a sense of humour. <laughs> but you know something? This absence of a continued, strong, coherent, rules-based order of the type we as the community of nations have painstakingly constructed uh, in the decades since 1945 is of fundamental relevance for countries such as our own to navigate our futures. The great advantage of a global rules-based order, particularly the liberal international order which we share in the period since 1945, is that it is designed to uphold the interests of small and middle countries in particular. Great powers have a view about themselves sometimes delusional, but sometimes not in the case of seriously great powers such as the United States, that they can independently sustain their national interests in the absence of any global rules-based system to assist them in so doing. Countries such as ours do not have that luxury. In the absence of any functioning rules, for example, uh, for the management of global trade, where would we be today as Australia when 42% of Australian GDP derives from uh, the traded sector of our economy. If we are looking, therefore, at the fundamental dismembering of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the World Trade Organization, which gives those rules institutional effect, and the disputes resolution mechanisms which hang off the WTO, then the future ultimately heads in a deeply mercantilist direction where the power of the great prevails and the power of the not so great is on display for all. 
The rules then being dictated bilaterally by those who dominate the system and those who do not become the rule takers, not the rule makers. So when we look at the beginnings of the fragmentation of this global rules-based order, it's not a matter of just abstraction from core Australian future interests. It's directly relevant. It affects that which we do. And not just in trade, not just in global investment flows, not just in terms of global human rights norms, not just in terms of the rules of international armed conflict, not just in terms of the rules which govern the protection of civilians in time of war, or our responsibilities under international statute to look after those who become dispossessed and become refugees and become asylum seekers. This fabric has been painstakingly put together by generations who have preceded us in the following the deep global trauma of the last world war. But bit by bit, the fabric of this order is coming unstuck, not least because the United States of America is in the process of itself becoming somewhat unstuck. Number four, the polarization of our Western democracies so that the possibility now of fashioning durable political consensus uh, in the centre of our polities, be it of the centre-left and the centre-right, becomes increasingly difficult, reflecting in turn divisions between poor and rich within our Western democracies, reflecting as well the polarisation of our traditional media between what I describe as the far right, that's Murdoch land, but elements too of what I describe as the faux left, and then the balkanisation of social media to the extent that the ability to constitute a continuing commons on which to construct a valid continuing reforming centre for our respective democracies here in North America as well as in Europe and elsewhere comes under challenge. Five, and related to four, are the intrinsic challenges facing the parties of the centre-left and the centre-right themselves. You begin to see this in so many countries. Those of you who look carefully at the politics of Germany will see, bit by bit, the ability of the Christian Democrats or the CSU, its coalition partner in Bavaria, being eaten away by the inroads of Alternative for Deutschland, uh, essentially a neo-fascist party of the far right. You see the inroads made by the Front National in the politics of France. You see what has happened with the merger of the Brexit party with the UKIP party with now elements of the Tory party in producing a new politics in the United Kingdom of the far right as well. Or you see the same phenomena unfolding in various countries around the world with the politics of the far left. And so we begin to see the external manifestation of the collapse of the centre of global Western politics in particular. Number six, somewhat controversially, is this question. Underpinning all the above, and I say this in particular in relations to countries of the traditional West, including this one, we are now at sea on our question of underpinning definitions of the values in which we believe. The relativization of these values is in fact being manifest in society, the norms that we prosecute in our business communities, uh, the disarray of some of our national politics, but also as we seek to reflect those norms beyond our shores as well. Some will note with passing satisfaction the decline of Christianity. It is a monumental transformation occurring in these generations. After 1700 years of predominance in the collective West as a body of ideas governing underpinning values, we now find ourselves in a period of radical secularization. But in terms of the Enlightenment rationalist empiricist project, which has replaced and sought to replace the Judeo-Christian worldview, we have as well an Enlightenment project, Enlightenment project uncertain about its own values compass. What is right, what is wrong? What is permissible, what is not? I say this not as an advocate of a particular view. I say this as someone concerned about 
whether in fact we are seeking to address the core challenges facing our nation and our civilization's future as the ethical underpinnings of what we've described as our Western polities itself enter into periods of great and fundamental question. And finally, on top of all the above, with all these great change drivers sweeping across our collective Western democracies, including this one in Australia, the fact is this, these things are all unfolding simultaneously. And they are unfolding simultaneously at a time when the institutions charged with delivering responses to these great mega changes of our age, some of which are producing meta changes of our time as well, when the institutions of political governance are themselves under fundamental threat in terms of the integrity which the community associates with them. In other words, we have not only an unprecedented complexity in dealing with these deep and fundamental structural challenges sweeping across our countries, from the economy through technology to climate to the nature of our politics, et cetera, and what we believe in, when the institutions of our political governance are themselves dealing, them, dealing with fundamental pressures about their own intrinsic legitimacy. In other words, it's all pretty simple. Not for the period that we now face. I said before that what I'd seek to do tonight is two things. One, identify what I, I see as being a set of seven fundamental challenges uh, which we face, which frankly require sustained responses by our national body politic, not those for sim a simple political season, then only to change our mind a few years later before we've forgotten why we ever did it in the first place. But I said I'd also try to sketch out tonight what constitute the foundation stones for a durable national vision for our country's future, mindful of the great existential challenges that we face. For these foundation stones, let me say I believe there are three of them. One relates to us as a country, as a people, defining our Australian identity and being comfortable with that identity. Two, to define also the values for which we stand and proudly stand for the future. And three, to be clear in our mind about what are the fundamental, driving, continuing national interests which we're seeking to serve here in this country, Australia, as well. If we have some clarity about these three sets of propositions, it then becomes possible within that framework to construct a national policy strategy for dealing with the far-reaching challenges I've just referred to. You cannot, in my argument, skip over these questions of identity, skip over these questions of values, or skip over these questions of enduring national interests as if they are simply assumed. They are not, and they cannot be assumed any longer. They need to be resolved through a process of national debate and national conversation. So let me speak briefly about each of them in the 10 minutes or so that I have remaining. Number one, on the question of our national identity, who we are as a people. I argue as a political progressive that we need to be clear cut in our definition of who we are as a people. And that our definition of an Australian identity is not based on a question of race or ethnicity. It is based on a set of ideas and a set of laws. When we speak of an Australian identity, for example, it must begin with our underlying indigeneity. The fact that this vast continent of ours uh, was inherited from time immemorial uh, from indigenous peoples who have been in this vast landmass for 70,000 years the oldest continuing cultures on earth, as I said in the language of the National Apology 10 years ago. And therefore, we should own with pride that in our national identity as Australians, we ourselves, even as the European occupiers who came later, are privileged to share this vast continent with the people of the Dreamtime. It cannot be excluded or pushed to one side. 
even though some may find this uncomfortable. I think very few these days, but still some. But in fact, embraced with a sense of pride and, and, and a legitimate sense of inclusiveness that we share this continent with those who have been here since time immemorial. And second, in our notion of national identity, that we also embrace, let's call it our Anglo-Celtic foundations in terms of those who came here as the first European settlers, usually in chains, like my own forebears, both sides. Deep criminality. <laughs> Hence my career in politics. <laughs> but that is a great inheritance, by which I mean through this we inherit not only a concept of an independent legal system, a concept of a Bill of Rights coming out of the events of 1688 and prior to that with Magna Carta, but we inherit it also a view that democratic institutions arbitrating through systems of independent laws presided over by independent courts are the way in which we conduct and resolve our political business. And at the same time, through our Celtic inheritance, a sense of continuing rebellion, a, con a continuing sense that we will not tolerate in this country a sense of one person being better than another, higher than another, or somehow of a superior class to another. And we are both these things in our Anglo-Celtic foundations. But our identity does not stop there. Our identity is equally and must be equally embracing of the millions of Australians who have come to these shores from vastly different countries and cultures than the original Anglo-Celtic monoculture. And so it does not matter whether we are people of the dream time, whether we are people of Anglo-Celtic origin, or whether we have arrived yesterday from Iraq. The fact is, we have come to this country unified in a system of laws through which we share common responsibilities and through which we also exercise powerful individual and guaranteed rights. That is our definition of our identity. It is an inclusive definition of identity and should never be one subject to anyone by implication or design seeking to define the identity of this country as being equivalent to race. I said also that a foundation stone for an effective national vision for our country's future lies in our values. Identity and values are concepts in political science and in sociological theory which are often seen as co-definitional. In fact, they are interrelated, but not entirely co-definitional. When we think of values for this country called Australia, we often lurch in directions of either the left or the right. If you are from the right, people will say, the values on which this country are based are those of freedom, individual freedom. They rest on values of enterprise, your ability to work in a free market to maximise your profit and returns for you and your family. It is also a set of values from the conservative side of our tradition which places premium on what we would describe as security. Freedom, enterprise, security. It sounds like a Republican press release. But you know something? Wherever you come from on the political spectrum, these are valid traditions. But the challenge for progressive politics and a progressive vision of Australia's future is to temper those values of freedom, of enterprise, of prosperity and security with those which are equally alive in our human nature, the other regarding values of our human nature, those alive in Smith's theory of moral sentiments from the get-go, in the beginning of the capitalist or liberal capitalist project, values which go to notions of justice, notions of public good, notions of compassion, Notions also of my responsibilities be beyond my immediate circle, including care for my environment and care for the planet itself. And so the task of our national vision when it comes to cohering our set of national values is to say we are neither this nor that, we are actually all these things together. Sometimes those on the left argue 
This security agenda is about the securitization of everything, and therefore I reject it. Well, no. Working people wish to be secure from attack, and that is an entirely valid value to be concerned about. A working person wants to be free to express their point of view. That's an entirely valid value. And a working person may have an aspiration entrepreneurially to establish their own business and become prosperous and no longer be the recipient of paid employment. Well, that's entirely valid as well. But it is extinguishing of the human character and personality, particularly within this country, to say it is not valid for me to have equal regard for my fellow human being, equal regard for someone who has not had equality of opportunity in their life, equal regard for someone who through catastrophic injury or external events requires a humane safety net in their lives, or equal regard for protecting our environmental commons. So my argument in terms of our nation and the fashioning of a national vision for our country is that we need to embrace this collectivity of values and own them with pride and with comfort. And finally, identity, values, and enduring interests. What are our enduring national interests? Those of you who are students of international relations have probably gone through the discipline. Those of you in particular who are students of foreign policy studies will have gone through the discipline. But it's frankly fundamental for all of us. For a country such as Australia, I would argue there are probably five. Number one, defending our territorial integrity. If there is no nation, that is, the actual physicality of this country called Australia, then all subsequent debates about what sort of nation we should be are rendered redundant. It might be old fashioned, it might be a quaint view, my father was a World War II veteran. For him, it was less, less than quaint, it was real. But the question of sustaining the long-term defense of our territorial integrity is not an idle national interest. It is a continuing national interest. And in an age where we in our settled history have been the beneficiaries of over 230 years being allied either to the previous great power of the world, the United Kingdom, and the current great power of the world, the United States, but looking to the future, when this Anglosphere may not prevail as the great power of all, cast this question of our future territorial integrity in a different light altogether, most particularly for your generation into the future. Secondly, sustaining and defending our political sovereignty. Territorial integrity and political sovereignty are allied but different concepts. How do we sustain our sovereignty as a nation? How do we preserve ourselves in terms of the integrity of our political systems free from external interference? And here I don't ref refer to the rolling debates about foreign interference law in this country. I refer to things like cyber. I refer to things like the ability of the technology companies to control vast amounts of people's private information. I refer to the question of the assumption that we remain politically sovereign as a people. A third enduring interest is this, to build our future prosperity. This is not a given. After 230 years of settled history, there is sometimes an assumption that Australia is a country of linear growth. A, it's not always been thus. For those of you who have had uh, distant relatives who were children or older than that during the Great Depression, but certainly there have been multiple recessions since then. But for the future, crafting out with our hands and our minds the future drivers of this nation's prosperity in order to ensure that people's living standards are sustained and that we have sufficient national capacity to provide the public goods for which the entire nation depends, most particularly our social interventions, including our capacity to defend ourselves, is itself an enduring interest building the new drivers of Australia's future prosperity. A fourth continuing interest out of five. And that is to do three above in a manner which now adheres to the underlying principles of sustainable economic development. The days when we could simply externalize 
the environmental impact of that which we do in the economy are well and truly gone. Look at what has happened, for example, with the Murray-Darling Basin system. Look at what has happened more broadly when it's been assumed in China, for example, that you could have 40 years of breakneck economic and industrial development and pay no heed to environmental consequences, the result being the suffocation of people in cities because the air quality is so bad. And the multiple incidents of new uh, airborne diseases uh, through that having happened over several decades. In other words, environmental sustainability is not simply a bourgeois choice anymore. It is a fundamental existential reality to sustaining this country, the driest on earth, and therefore at the cutting edge of the impact of global climate change. And finally, an enduring interest for us all is to continue to sustain the global rules-based order I spoke of before. We are, at the end of the day, the 12th largest economy in the world. We are, at the end of the day, the 55th largest country in the world in terms of our population. We are, by land area, one of the largest countries in the world, and certainly in terms of our coastline and our exclusive economic zone. But our ability to sustain our sovereignty in those domains, as well as to be effective agents in the region and the world, depend foundationally on our ability to sustain the institutions of global governance and the global rules-based order. We cannot independently operate in that system alone. We need fundamentally to prosecute our interests in the global economy and in maximizing our security and in ensuring we have global action on climate change, a functioning rules-based order. And this, therefore, is not an abstraction for IR students. It is a core business for the nation and everything we seek to do. Because in international relations theory terms, the collapse of the great divide between the foreign and the domestic, the external, the internal, the national from the international, is already known and experienced by policymakers and political leaders the world over. When the G7 meets or the G20 meets at summit level, as I've participated in it before, everything we discuss, which is technically global, is simultaneously national and local. So I conclude my remarks this evening by saying these, in my view, constitute the foundation stones for an effective national vision for our future. In other words, being clear about the widespread global structural challenges which are now bearing down on the nation. But in responding to each of those challenges with a coherent policy strategy, to do so in a manner which does not compromise who we are as a people, which does not compromise the values for which we stand and the values which cohere us as a nation, and furthermore, is consistent with our enduring national interests which pass from one generation to the next and not just a single political cycle. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.